things on Medium. Um, and also he's written two books, one on AI game engines and one on the sort of psychology of AI. He's been at various uh, big game companies, including Blizzard, where he worked with Hearthstone. Um, he was at Magic Leap, and uh, now he is, this is a non-exhaustive list, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and is at Lego in London, and he's here to talk to us about all sorts of interesting stuff uh, under the kind of heading of the psychology of AI. So, Brian, so good to have you. Please, if you want to get started, we're ready for you. Uh, um, I'm here to give you guys a little talk, and and for me, when I talk about game AI, I venture into the world of human psychology more often than I do computer science. And you'll find out why as we go forward. So who the hell am I? I think Miriam gave you a tiny little taste, but I've been doing games for a long time. Um, when I finally left Blizzard, I, I, I shipped Hearthstone and that was, I think my 18th or 19th game that I shipped. And so like I, I shipped a lot of games, many, many different uh, genres. Some of the ones on the bottom are, are just some of them, right? Um, fighting game, uh, first person shooter, sports title, I did an education game, I did a location based ride, I did all kinds of things. It's pretty hilarious, actually. Um, and what I found was that over the years, I was not buying too many more computer science or AI books. What I kept finding was over the years, as the game companies changed, as the games themselves changed, as the customers changed, I found myself buying more and more psychology books, more cogsci, more sociology, more uh, science of, of biases and heuristics. How, how does a human work? And so psychology ended up being one of my primary things that I, that I focused on. And, and, and it's largely because no matter what you're making, you know, you're, you're always making it for a human, right? And humans have a lot of crazy issues. I've, I've always found that the, that the term AI itself, especially in games, is a really odd choice for what we do because it's really not what we're doing. We're not trying to make something intelligent usually. We're trying to make something kind of behave like a human. I mean, unless, unless you're trying to make vampires or, or space goats or whatever, but, but even then, what human beings tend to think of as intelligent, they tend to think of as, as is actually just, they, they're acting like a human does. And that's what they call human. And so it's not even that you want it to be intelligent. You don't want the most clever thing possible. You want it to be entertaining. And so I jokingly say that we should be called EH programmers. Uh, um, of course, my notifications are gonna go up. Oh God. Um, and then the other thing that the reason that psychology is important is because immersion is important. And, and a lot of experiences that we're making nowadays are concerned very, very heavily with immersion, but it's not just that the experience themselves, the experience themselves are, are immerse, immersing our, our customers in, in better and better experiences. It's that we're getting an enormous amount of data for the first time ever on our, on our on our customers, either because they're playing on a mobile phone that we have uh, a lot of their time and energy that we can get data from, or they're, or they're spending a lot of time in persistent worlds on, on their PC, or, or maybe they're wearing a, a head-mounted display and we get a, a ton of crazy intimate data from them directly. Um, so knowing your audience is super important because customers are demanding that level of immersion, not just in the world building that we're making and the story crafting that we're doing, but actually in their recognition of, of who they are as a person, just simply because they are spending so much time with us. So some of you are gonna get bored really fast. So I wanted to quickly put some easy takeaways for you that just are gonna be here for five minutes. The first takeaway is that always remember that game AI is about the illusion, the illusion of truth. You're not actually making the next artificially intelligent sentient being that, that will give us all, you know, uh, uh, a handshake and a, and a glory, glory pass into the future. You're, you're, you're heavily invested in smoke and mirrors. I, I, I don't mean to be a spoiler here, but the vast majority of magicians on the planet do not rely on actual magic. They tend to fake it a bit. 
And so just remember that that's more what you are doing as an AI programmer in the game industry. You are not making something intelligent. You are making people believe that it is intelligent by whatever means possible. The second big takeaway that I always tell people in psychology is that human beings feel bad about two and a half times as much as good. They, they remember it more strongly. They feel it more strongly. They recall it much more strongly. And so always remember that if you are making it a game, a game and, and you quote unquote want it to be fair, which means you know maybe naively that, that they win half the time, the average person will walk away from that experience feeling overall negative. If they win 75% of the time, that's about break even. That's about where they start to feel like, okay, this is a good game. I feel like I feel like a positive, net positive most of the time. So always remember that we are dealing with people that are a little bit sensitive to badness. And that's the reason why a lot of games sort of focus on, on giving you a little bit extra reward. And lastly, the reason that I always tell people to focus on psychology is because no matter what game you're making, like I said in my intro, audiences are usually human. And so if you don't know some level of mastery of, of, the, of the audience that you're dealing with and all of the foibles and craziness that, that, they're, that, they, that they're coming to the table with, it's kind of like you're going into a fist fight with, with one arm tied behind your back. It's, it's even worse than that because you, you could potentially win and win a fist fight with only one arm. Whereas I think the vast majority of gaming AI nowadays doesn't really win that fist fight, right? They, they sort of are, are just sort of wildly swinging it at things. And we, and we kind of go, oh, that's cute. They're trying to be smart. So let's talk about some of the landmines as we go through all of the crazy things in, in the human mind. Um, I'm going to like try and blast through these a little bit because I want to just bring up a number of different topics um, that I want people to think about. I, I want you to maybe go back and, and, and look at this deck again later and just Google search some things from here because I, I don't want to go deep on anything. I just want to try and spark some, some brain in, in, in thinking about different things in your audience. So in the world of influence, if you want to influence your, your, your customer, your player, the number one thing you got to remember is that you have to know wh where they're looking, why they're looking there, right? That people's attention is their most precious resource. Now, on average, on average, I think uh, the estimates are that we bring in about 11 million bits per second in sensory data. And yet the brain only can process about 120 bits per second. And, and so there's only so much that you can really focus your conscious attention on. And that, that number is actually pretty, pretty big. I've actually seen uh, um, them saying that, that that 120 bits per second only really works if you're talking about activities or things that are very deeply rooted, like, like listening to another human being or, or uh, doing something that you've known for your entire life. If, if, if it's something new or something very, very complicated, it can go all the way down to only 50 bits per second. Um, and, and in some cases, I've, I've seen estimates where it takes 60 bits per second just to listen to another human being. So if you want somebody to do something fairly complex and you're giving them verbal instruction at the same time, that's probably not a great idea. But if you want to influence them, you better know where they're looking, where they're spending their time processing right now so that you can know where to put feedback and give them, and give them that influence that you need. Secondly is, you know, maybe you know where they're looking but you don't know what it is that they're thinking. Like what are their expectations when they walk into the room? Um, if you don't know these sorts of things, then you don't know where to start in order to influence them. You don't know how to adjust their, their current expectations to more closely meet the things that you want them to meet. And, and you know, I, I talk about changing people's influence, but the other part of it is just educating them in general. You, you need to influence people that not only should they learn your game, or learn what, what the rules of your game are, but, but that you wanna influence them to think that they're gonna like the game, that they're gonna enjoy it. And you don't have much time. Uh, today's economy is just rife with, with new experiences. There's thousands and thousands of games that come out new almost every day. And I jokingly, I put this picture here um, because I've, I've jokingly said before that some of the, one of the best teachers on the planet is the, is the hot stove. Like letting people touch the stove is, is crazy, 
crazy teaching. Like most people remember when they first touched the stove, they won't do it again. It only took once. It, it, think, about, think about the feedback systems involved in a hot stove, right? You, you know exactly what you did to get the, to get the bad thing to happen. It, it was very clearly communicated to you. It stopped almost immediately upon doing it and, and it was very easy for you to not do it again. The, the, that's the sort of educational feedback systems that, that if we can do it safely and not burn people, uh, that makes for good kind of education influence for, for a new game. Now, now we've, got, we've got you to, to sort of get into the game. How do we motivate you around the game? Well, once you, once you know where people's focus is, then what you can do is start to figure out what they intend to do with the thing that they're looking at. Are they gonna go pick it up? Are they gonna throw it? Are they gonna kill it? By knowing their intentions, you get powerful predictive notions about their behavior. And when, whenever you can get predictive on a person, that's when the AI has time enough to actually do something a bit more robust. If you're just reacting to behaviors that have happened in the past, you're just a reflex. You just are a reactive system. And the vast majority of AI that is considered not great in games, I think is only not great because it's being reflexive. It's being, it's, it's reacting to behaviors that have just happened instead of predicting some behaviors and maybe doing something ahead of time or slightly ahead of time or just at the right time. Another thing to remember when you're motivating players is that humans don't just see. We have all these other senses and some of these other senses are actually very, very useful for motivating players in different ways. You know, yes, the fastest way potentially to motivate a player on the direction to go is to put a flashing arrow and have them look in that direction. But auditory signals um, being a much older sense evolutionary wise and actually being a much faster sense evolutionary wise, um, are sometimes a better way of motivating, let's say a head movement or something, especially if it's a scary thing because it is a faster sense and it digs deeper into the emotional part of your brain. And so movies do this all the time where uh, the, the, the soundtrack will change and you know that it's going to, that, that something big is about to happen. Video games do the same. I can be walking down the hall and the music is do 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 and then I go around the corner and all of a sudden dun 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 and I know I should probably chug a, a health potion and do a save because that's that's at least mid boss music that I'm hearing right there and it's a nice motivator to not only like make my 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 mode of execution happen change in the game but it also potentially is, is associated with a little bit of anxiety because I know that there's danger nearby. It's like, it's like a, a beautiful way to motivate. There's a ton of other ways to motivate using social networks or just uh, um, puzzle solving or, or all sorts of ways that you can motivate behavior. And lastly, like I said in the first slide, you, you've, you've, you've educated them and you've made a contract with the player um, and, and to a certain extent, you've set up some form of trusting relationship with that player, but now, how has the game uh, uh, upheld their end of the bargain? Have you, have you been rigorous with the rules and given them free reign to, to butt right up against all of the rules in the game and everything works exactly right? Or have you massaged it a little bit and, and made them feel like, ooh, is that a real rule or is that a rule that I need to poke with a stick first before I really go in there? Trust in a relationship, just like it is in a human relationship, is is something that you don't mess with because you, you want it to last for a long time and it builds bonds and it does all these good things, but it's also a, a rich source of, of, of kind of like spice to keep people interested in, in the game by, by tweaking their trust just a little bit, but like giving it back to them. It's, it's a fun way of thinking about rules in a game as being um, boundaries and, and, and you know, needs in a relationship. In an overall experience standpoint, think about the shape of your full experience. If you've never actually uh, um, Googled Kurt Vonnegut's uh, story shapes uh, uh, talk, I, I heavily recommend it. That's what this, this graph is from. And, and you know, he, he draws his little axis on the board and it goes from good experience to bad experience and from the start of the, start of the story to the end of the story. And you know, he says, okay, the man starts out, he falls in a hole and he gets out of the hole. You know, and then he jokingly says, you know, people love that story. 
and and it's not it's not that that he's trying to do a, a reducto uh, absurdium, right? He's he's basically trying to say that like the the overall flow of a story can be fairly fairly simple and still be compelling, and and it's not that you should find a, a particular progression that, that, that you want to emulate. It should be more have a progression in mind so that you can see almost graphically, you know, how much am I asking of the player? And that goes right into the next thing I'm about to say, which is how much have I asked and for how long have I asked it? You know, have I given them too much negative energy for too long? Can I, can I bring them back up for a while and then take them back down again? Pacing and, and those sorts of issues um, can, can, can be done by, by knowing the overall shape of your, of, your, of your story and having events in your story tied to the emotional changes in your story as well. The other part of the cognitive load, which remember 120 bits per second, is that the brain can only process so much at a time. And, and like any computer, if you're burning through your CPO all the time, you're going to get tired. You're going to get to the point where slowly you're going to be like, I need a break. Um, you may have heard of AI directors, and this is sort of like the lowest version of, of that notion, which is that like, let's give people a little bit of action, let them, let them intensely you know, fight, whatever it is, and then give them a pause. And then they can regroup, they can find some power-ups, but they can also feel a little bit of respite and then bring them back up. And, and those sorts of systems are used in, in the short term to do kind of just sort of overall encounter pacing and in some cases, some story beats and those sorts of things. But you could use those types of systems that take into account cognitive load and fatigue to a much higher degree if you're watching for the types of things that people do or, or for per people's performance to change over time. You can really get a sense as to like how fatigued are they and on what axes of, of performance that they're, that they're maybe need a break on. The third overall thing that I always talk about with experience and psychology is, is agency. Um, a lot of games, uh, let's put it this way, a lot of entertainment doesn't have a lot of agency, right? Like if I go to a movie, I sit there, I be quiet, I watch the movie, I enjoy it. Uh, same with books, same with other things. I think that, yes, our individual interpretations are different, but overall, I'm not part of the conversation. Video games have always been a little bit more in that direction. That's what the word interactivity means, right? Is that I'm involved in some, some respect to, to the unfolding events in the, in the, in the experience. But games over, over, over the course of the last 20 so odd years have definitely gotten more and more in terms of agency. If I even look back at like some of the early Unreal games versus the, the Unreal universe and mod universe that eventually started to get us to the point where Fortnite could be prototyped and is now a thing and is now largely a, an experiment in first person uh, 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 craziness, right? Like, like, yes, there is a lot of curated content in Fortnite, but there's also a hell of a lot of player agency in them deciding how they want to play that, what version of it they want to play, who they want to play with, and how they want to even bother. It's a, it's a beautiful thing as we start to go further and further into AI systems that have the ability to re react and adapt their strategies based on house rules, if you will, that we get more and more ability to have additional player agency. Because to me, player agency is a form of kind of like saying, hey, yes, I want to give you my world. I want to show you these beautiful, wonderful things that I have been paid to, to, to put out there for, for gamers. But at the same time, I want them to be involved. I want it to be a conversation, not a lecture, right? And it's kind of hilarious to me that I'm in the middle of a lecture right now, when in reality, I would love to be in the room with you guys all talking and asking questions. Because for me, that's actually why I got into games. That's why I, I work at Lego right now, because I, I believe in handing the thing to you and, and, and having that conversation as, as we experience it together. Um, anytime you talk about humans and psychology, you basically have to start talking about bias. Bias is interesting because people tend to think of it as negative. Um, human beings, again, bring in a, 
11 million pieces of sensory information every second. They can only compute 120 bits per second of that into, into usable surviving things. And so a lot of what human beings did over the years was just copy paste survival things from each other and, and, and keep on evolving, right? And so don't think of bias as being some sort of negative uh, uh, bugs in the system so much as it's, this is, the, this is the code that kept us alive for a couple hundred thousand years as we evolved into the people we are, the beings that we are. And while some cases, those biases could be fully wrong, fully wrong, at some level, they kept us alive. And so like, you know, just knowing these things and not thinking of them as negative, thinking of them as like what, what they were used for originally will help you to see that like, these, these are interesting little foibles about the human brain. And if you know them, you know a little bit better how to work with the brain. It's kind of like, you know, I'm a sculptor and these are all of the weird little things I should know about the particular type of marble that I, that I sculpt in, right? So um, if, you, if you've ever seen this chart up at the top, with the brain, there's 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 hundreds of, of cognitive biases, right? There's, there's just hundreds, and there's probably two or three video games that like, like base their entire game mechanic suite on on each one of those cognitive biases. If you really go in there, I'm not even going to bother really going into them. I've I've just sort of listed out a few of these as I go because these are the ones I think that are are most directly sort of stuff that you should look into when you're when you're deciding on story arcs and and how your AI should be toned and all that sort of thing. Decision, decision making for human beings is not rational. It is not logical. It is human, right? And, and we have a, a very huge set of wacky little things you should, kn you should know about how we make decisions because if your AI makes decisions in the same way, it's gonna feel very human, which again, is going to feel more intelligent. It's not potentially even gonna be more intelligent, but it's gonna feel more intelligent. Um, memory and perception. There is a ton of illusions, biases, uh, um, weird things that happen around how you recall things, how you thought you saw something when you didn't really see it. If there's one thing that going to Magic Leap for six years taught me, it is a ton of optometry and how the eye works. And, and I never thought I would learn as much about the human visual system as I did when I was in college to be an electrical engineer, um, but but here I am. And the interesting thing about you know even just the eye, much less memory, is that is that you 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 don't see the vast majority of what you think you saw. You have a combination of what you saw, um, um, you know the the bits of photons that hit your eye from bouncing off of whatever it was. You also have a uh, a bit of your brain remembering what it saw the last time it looked over there and it's assuming based off of maybe it categorized it as a large static object that it's mostly the same so it's sort of making some assumptions based off what it saw before and and lastly it's it's even to some degree if it if it d didn't see it before and it didn't see it this time but it can kind of look at the scene around it and kind of go well you know what it doesn't really make much sense if that table only has two legs, I'm just gonna t I'm just gonna add a, add a, at least one leg in so that so that it does make sense mentally when I when I look at, look at it in my mind. And so your your brain will just pop something in there just simply because it makes sense. And all of that adds up to be like what I saw, and and that's hilarious. And if you know some of those sorts of rules and like how your brain is working, like like here's an interesting one. If I know that you're looking in this direction, and I know approximately where you're looking, because maybe I even have eye tracking on you, um, I can put a little bit of motion at the very edge of your of your field of vision. And because of the way the human eye works, most of what we can see out at the very edge of our field of vision is motion. And in fact, the reason why is because as as you know, creatures on the low end of the totem pole, predator-wise motion meant run the hell away. 
And so you're very sensitive to motion at the edges of your vision because your body knows it's staring off in this direction. It knows that that means that this spot over here is the least guarded as far as sort of like knowing what's going on. And so if you see a little bit of thing here, it's much more likely to spur a little bit of surprise and you're almost always gonna have people turn their head towards that thing. That is an interesting bias towards motion at the edge of your vision that you can then use uh, um, to, to get people's attention and to drag them, drag their attention somewhere very easily, much easier than saying, look over there. Um, or, or even having a, an audio thing that I talked about earlier where somebody says, help me, help me, I'm over here, and you put it over there. Yeah, that sometimes will get them to look unless the voice is scary to them, they might run away. Whereas if I just sort of put a little motion, it doesn't even have to be anything because I can barely see what it is. I can just see the motion. You can get people to look over there almost every time. And lastly, we not only have biases at the level of our individual brains, but we have biases at the level of, of groups of us, right? Like if I have a person walk up to me and they're dressed in a, in a particular uniform, there is a good chance that I will act very differently to, the, to what they have to say to me than if they are not in a particular uniform. And that's an interesting societal rule. It doesn't really mean anything to an individual person, right? Uh, um, but, but it's a bias that humans in general have and, and certain societies have even stronger than others, right? And so knowing a lot of those societal biases can give you ways in which you can make AIs that take advantage of those biases or, or comply with those biases so that AIs feel like they're doing what they should do. Like if I'm as a player I'm dressed up in a particular, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor and I walk into the room, people should act as if I'm a doctor, you know, they should defer to me just a little bit and feel like I'm, I'm there to help them, let's say. <clears throat> And then along those social biases, we can go right into a group of human behaviors that are very social oriented, right? Um, the first, of course, everybody, I'm sure you'll learn a ton of this in, in any sort of game AI work that you do is nonverbal communication. Um, it's not only super valuable to know a ton about nonverbal comms, just simply because it's so prevalent in human behavior. You know, most of what we say is actually nonverbal. And now that we have head mounted displays, we can actually start getting the data necessary to like fully, fully like understand nonverbal communications for the first time ever. It's very difficult to tell nonverbal communications when I've got my hands on a joystick like this, right? Whereas if I can watch your head, listen to your, 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 your speech, watch where your hands are doing things, and maybe even listen to your, your breathing patterns, your, your overall posture, I can do all kinds of cool things and like learn your, your What's, what's really going on with you in a much, much better way. And when you have AIs that then respond in kind, suddenly the immersion level goes way up because I'm, I'm, I'm finally getting an AI opponent or, or a collaborator that's acting and giving me all of that extra communication that I get from normal people that I normally don't get from AI controlled characters. So people have very specific behavior socially, but groups also do, crowds, are a completely different animal from a human being. Um, crowds have an ungodly amount of extra stuff that you should know, and they don't, they don't act like people. They act like, you know, this weirdly weaponized amoeba, if you will, that, that, that like, you better know how crowds react. You better watch for the signs of how crowds react if you just happen to be a protester, let's say, because that's the animal that you're currently maybe even a part of. Um, or you're at a concert or something like that. These rules are just as human as all of the things we've talked about so far with just regular people, except now I'm talking about crowds of people. Um, and there's also an interesting bunch of behavior that happens amongst human beings that are, that are sharing, that are in collaboration. And sometimes this comes into, a, into effect if you're making um, you know, collaborative AI like, like you've got a companion that's following you around in a game and, and, and doing whatever. But it also comes into effect when you're making um, you know, multi-user environments and you've got, uh, um, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's not a game, let's say it's a collaboration application and they've got 
you know, computer generated avatars and you're being asked to add just a little bit of AI so that like I can glean some signals from the user and, and have them show up in an intelligent fashion that, that roughly models what it is that I'm doing onto this CGI avatar. Like knowing a lot of these things can also help in non-game scenarios just as much as it does in games, right? The reason I bring up entrainment, um, I would, I would Google that again, if I were you, it's kind of a deep notion. I did some research on it. It turns out that like in, in a lot of systems, living and, and non-living, um, everything from pendulum clocks to, to uh, uh, you know, fireflies. Um, if, if you have oscillatory systems in a, in, a, in a proximate area, they will start to align their oscillations or they'll start to align the signal frequencies across the different entities um, somewhat automatically. And like I said, it happens with non-living and in-living systems, which is interesting. It's one of the things like I, I went to a, a CogSci uh, conference a few years back and the lady gave a pretty awesome uh, talk on, on group uh, um, grooving at concerts where the, based on the type of music and how intimate the, 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 genre, the the arena was and 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 all sorts of factors like how much the brainwave synchronization and 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 by effect the the, the overall uh, um, enjoyment of the of the concert was and 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 did this whole paper on it it was it was fascinating work so I want to also talk about just some very weird human things um, to watch out for humans love to make up reasons why things are happening because we love to predict, right? We love to know ahead of time why something might happen so that we can, we can plan for it. Uh, um, and, and this is free, like, like people just do this all the time. The number of times that you will have a game where somebody will, will come to you afterwards and they'll be like, oh my God, I was playing your game last night and I was in the middle of building such and such technology and I saw this unit whiz by and I knew that he saw me building that thing. And so now he's gonna go over and sure enough, he started amassing those units in the exact right spot. And, and but then when I went to go, to go out to, to attack him, he totally, totally got me and he, and, he, and he came on my left side. And, and meanwhile, you're sitting there listening to him and you're like, yeah, none of that happened. Uh, um, yes, I automatically send out some patrols, but they're largely just there to make you think that I'm patrolling. They don't really pool much information because the, uh, you know, the influence mapping technology that we're using on this game ended up getting de de scoped because we didn't have time for it. And and uh, um, you know, the only reason that I amassed my forces in that spot was because that's actually one of the bottlenecks that the level designer put into the level automatically. And so there's a little bit of intelligence just baked into the level that I I can make use of because I get stuck in a corner with just a couple of bottlenecks. And meanwhile, the user thought all of that was super intelligent, super smart, and they love that story in their head that gave them that, that ability to see, to make sense of all of that, right? So don't give users too much detail. Make things a little mysterious, because otherwise you're going to like ruin that, that notion that people have. And, and that's actually some of the stuff that people love about games is its ability to kind of trigger in them these beautiful complex descriptions of why things happen, the story, the story of what happened that they can tell their friend is in many cases almost as enjoyable as actually doing the thing in the game. The second thing to always remember, and I've given a couple of talks on this, is that human beings do not know probability in any fashion whatsoever. We're not probabilistic creatures, we're statistical creatures. And so anytime randomness is involved, it's very unintuitive to most people. And so especially because most games are fairly short term and randomness doesn't really become statistical, obviously, until, until you have enough instances of random events that it kind of comes out in the wash. And so what I would suggest is to always understand the level of lameness that human beings have around randomness and usually use more statistical methodologies to get done what you need in the shorter time. And always remember the uncanny valley. Human beings have this funny thing that no matter what it is, if, it's, if it starts to get too real, 
there's this weird trough where suddenly we flip from noticing all of the things that are actually very, very cool and very close to the actual thing that it's trying to model. And suddenly it flips over to, now I can only see the things that are negative. And, and I actually jokingly always, I've always thought that like one of the best and most ironic examples of the Uncanny Valley was in uh, the movie AI with Haley Jonah, Joel Osment, which is funny to me because the, the robot, uh, the the kid is is played by a real human kid, right? Haley Haley Joel Osment is is playing this small AI controlled robot, and he's painfully creepy. Even even throughout basically the entirety of his journey to to quote unquote try and be more human, he's he's very creepy because yes, it is being played by a human, but the the they're doing a great job of showing you the foibles of, 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 a, of an AI system and, and not being able to grok exactly what's going on and not being able to like reproduce exactly what a human kid would reproduce or going a little too far. Whereas at the same exact time, he's being followed around by a small teddy bear and the teddy bear is completely CGI uh, uh, generated, computer generated, little bear that's following him around. And that thing is never, I've never met a human being that said, ooh, that little bear was creepy too though, you know? Like, because that's not the case. The stuffed animal, it's, it's kind of funny that, that like stuffed animal just happens to be over here on, 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 on this actual thing that I found. Um, but it's, it was in, in no way in the valley, right? Whereas Haley Joel Osment was like, I would say he's about, maybe about right here. He was quite a bit further down the trough. He wasn't down the where, where, where like he looked sick or bad or, or, or like a, a zombie, but he definitely had some, some problems. You know, people were like, hmm, I don't know if I want this around. And it just, it always makes me laugh that like the completely CGI thing actually was much, much more of a loyal and trusting and kind of like lovely companion. And meanwhile, the, the actual human being in the movie was seen as being this like creepy, uncanny thing. Um, lastly, I wanted to leave you with this, which is just a, a little selection of books. Uh, um, I, I like to, to always give people a, a, a pile of things to go home with and, and, and look at if they want. Um, I've, I've sort of listed these in, in order of, of like, what, what, what kind of stuff are you looking for? Um, and this is a wide smattering and, and nowhere near a list of, of what I would consider, you know, everything by, by, by at least two orders of magnitude. <laughs> so, so please, if, if there's other things that you would like to know about, or if you've already read all these and would like the next chunk, give me a holler and, and maybe we can, we can talk about that. And that's my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. Big applause. <laughs> you can't see the, the room here because this is being recorded. So, uh, so I can't like turn the camera around, but there was an applaud. Um, thank you so much for this. And uh, that uh, list of books in the end was uh, stellar. So if, if you wanna share the slides and I can, can share them, that would, that would be great. Uh, later on too. Yeah. Uh, how are you guys doing on questions? Do you have anything like just straight off the bat you would like to ask about? No, they are overwhelmed. Let's see about the chat. <laughs> just got some thank yous in the chat. It's cool. I, okay. I talk pretty fast though. Might have just blasted people. Yeah. You know, something that I was uh, thinking about, uh, about the psychology of AI, I remember that talk you gave on um, randomness uh, at GDC, I can't re re really remember the year, um, but, I, but I remember that that resonated really. So it's interesting that you kind of put it up here as this kind of thing that is only interesting if you can see some kind of stati statistical patterns in it. Yeah, there was, um, it was funny. Uh, uh, I remember one year, I forget what year it was. I want to say like 2014 or 15. Um, we were all sitting in the, the indie game 
Uh, um, no, I forget when it was. It was. Anyways, it was one of the bigger one of the bigger GDC halls. There was probably six, seven hundred of us in there, and Sid Sid Meyer was talking about civilization, right? And he was going on and on, and he was talking about how people would come to him and say that they felt like something was unfair or this wasn't quite right. Or, and I turned to the person next to me and I remember saying, he's gonna tell everybody the big secret. And he was like, what are you talking about? Because like, because like I, th I don't know, I think the person I was with was maybe um, like an environment artist or something. They weren't, they weren't another AI programmer, right? And so like, I go, he's gonna tell them all that, that he doesn't use the real numbers when he computes who's gonna win. <laughs> And, and he was like, what the hell? Because he was a hardcore Civ player because that's why we were in this talk was that Sid was going to talk about Civ, civilization, right? And he goes, he goes, yeah, so, you know, if you have a unit that's a one and you have a unit that's two and these guys at Tech, this unit should win 33% of the time and this unit should win 66% of the time, except for the fact that everybody hates that. And so he, he went on to, you know, look it up look it up it's a gdc talk in the, in the in probably on youtube at this point um he says i had a i have a a lookup table based on what the two forces are that i give the actual percentage that each one of those is going to win and it's it's also based on on who's who's the player that's playing which is crazy but but it's true and and it's one of those things where fudging the numbers even when the number is literally listed on the screen was super important, right? And it's partially because human beings don't understand randomness. And it's partially because, again, we're all doing all of this in the service of entertainment. <laughs> and so it was fascinating to me that, that Sid actually went out and told everybody that he was doing that because, you know, I don't think that a lot of people knew that. And meanwhile, those of us that were AI programmers for a long time, I had I had done you know probably a two hour survey of writing down every single time that I had attacked something and I figured that that, that was what was going on. Of course but, you did. Of course you did to write that down on the list on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to reverse engineer things sometimes. Somehow. Yeah. Another thing I was uh, thinking about you, when you were at Blizzard then. You worked at this uh, uh, company, this uh, thing doing like big story worlds. Remember what was the name of that? Yeah. So after I left Blizzard, I joined a small startup called Story Bricks. Exactly. Which is Bricks. hilarious. Hilarious that I now work at like Lego Bricks. Yeah. But but um, uh, um, and what Story Bricks was is we were trying to we had we had gotten the contract for Sony Online and we were going to try and redo their quest system for the next EverQuest. And we were trying to procedurally generate quests um, and allow them to tie into procedurally generated story arcs. And so we actually sat down and worked with the designers to try and figure out how to uh, um, rewrite the game lore in terms of a number of different uh, uh, resources that we could effectively kind of like ace our way around story-wise. So if you were here in the space of story possibility and the, the, the designers had made some little story bit that was like nice and beautiful, but it needed to like have the right prerequisites, we could kind of like get you a set of quests that would sort of put you in the right direction that now you could hook up with this story chunk. You could make a nice, curated bit of story, but then set you free again out into the soup where you could search around and try and find. And so we were trying to kind of like proceduralize questing and story generation while at the same time giving the, the designers the ability to make very, very crafted stories. And we were doing a really good job of it. Sony Online Entertainment ended up getting sold to another company, which is not something we saw coming. But, but um, um, so I didn't get to ship that one. But it was a it was a wonderful experience in in trying to give people what they wanted and also trying to increase that that player agency that I talked about in the talk to today. Yeah, no, because I remember trying out. Uh, there was uh, like a tech demo. Uh, I, yeah. I was uh, trying out, and it we, was we so actually made a tech demo based on Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and it was kind of funny because like you would you would make this you would make choices. But then slowly that they would come back and they would they would form alliances and they would start attacking you and and 
and people really resonated with that because this was before um, they ruined Game of Thrones. And so like we were able to kind of like really, really resonate with folks at the time. Yeah. I, I, I have a comp another question too that I want to ask you, but before I want to check if anyone else has questions. <laughs> and I'm also going to check in the chat just to make sure that I don't forget anyone. So, I mean, I remember the time when we, when you were working on Hearthstone and, and you couldn't like say much about it and, and before you uh, kind of released it, but I was so amazed to see that. Did you ever kind of predict what a huge success it would be? I mean, we knew it was going to be a good, a good deal because Magic the Gathering is a very compelling game type. It was just too inaccessible. It had some of the same problems that, that let's say, EverQuest had, and that's why WoW did so well, right? Because it was just a, taking a genre that actually does have a good-sized audience and making it more accessible so that more people can get in and not feel quite so intimidated by a monstrous rule set or a little bit of, of difficult uh, um, user interface. And so we knew that, that the card game market was sort of viable because of Magic the Gathering. It's just that Magic the Gathering is, is like, you, you got to be a lawyer practically to kind of like play. And so what we wanted to do was see if we could use that same formula of kind of like making things more accessible and, and tapping into that market. The second thing that we wanted to do, obviously, which is we wanted to see if we could make a Blizzard quality game with a very small team. And so, you know, there was only 10 of us that made Hearthstone originally. And that was, that was the other thing that was fun was it was a game about breaking rules. And we were also breaking all of the rules of, of Blizzard itself while we were doing it, which was, was really kind of like this fun <laughs> sort of like meta level of thought while we were, while we were doing the project. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is. And I mean, and it's still doing well. It's still, it's still pumping out the cash. If I recall correctly, it, it only took a number of months to, to, to be making like an, an ungodly amount of money. And I think it still makes a billion dollars a year or something ungodly like that. It's, it's been going for like seven years and it's still, still chugging along. And so, I mean, I think at this point it's gotten less accessible like any game is that's, that's that old, but that was the original uh, ex experiment there. Yeah, you did something really good there. So cool. Uh, I was kind of like, I'm still playing World of Warcraft. Uh, and I know that the, the, some people are kind of working on uh, like big metaverses. I know that Raph Koster is doing something super interesting. And we have this whole kind of rise also of these non fungible objects. And um, I don't know, did you ever work on, on World of Warcraft where you were at Blizzard? I mean, you did work on the Sony. The, no, the only, the only, the only, um, you know, like, like, you know, and I, I had a really good experience at Blizzard, but I think it was because I had that tiny little team off to the side. Like I almost had like an individual experience there because our team was on a secret project and we pretty much were just off on our own. Um, but that being said, um, I will say that like working working at Magic Leap and sort of thinking about the, the, that notion of like the, the compute everywhere sort of metaverse experience, right? Like that, that is definitely something that I spent a bunch of time thinking about while I was at Magic Leap, you know, and especially because, I mean, Neil Stevenson actually worked at Magic Leap. And, and so like one of the first conversations I ever had with Neil actually was I was saying to him, you know, how does Magic Leap get past the problem that you talk about in your book, which is that the most connected to the internet people are, the, are like the, the untouchable cast, right? They were actually called zombies or something like that. I forget exactly what they were called, but they were like, they were like horrifying, right? And I said, how do we get past that notion that like the ultimate wearables is, is like even in your mind, very hardcore, not what you wanna be. And he, dove into like a 45 minute treatise on exactly why that was the case and how you could get around it. And all of this thinking that he had done on like where society needed to go and like why, 
he did that almost more as a as a sort of like thought experiment on like like yes that's one way that like connecting yourself to the metaverse and and, and almost losing yourself it's almost to a certain extent like his treatise on like you know uh, uh escapism is that is that eventually you're, you're less human you know what i mean whereas like the the rest of the people like like are very much like either in and out or they're they're doing a lot of their experiences out in the real world still right like like as 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 hardcore of a, of a mixed reality as as that book was as snow crash was it's actually about the effects of technology on the real world and so he had a a whole beautiful set of learning that he like tossed at me and so it was a really good place to learn about mixing digital and physical and kind of like taking into account like just how important physicality is you know like like i had always been a gameplay person and so for me having the joystick in my hands was always sort of part of what i did um but but it wasn't until magically that i really started to realize like how slippery a slope it is to where you start depending on all that extra digital craziness when in reality if you can just make something a bit more visceral and a little bit more human you can like connect more with the person and not have to have all of that extra stuff right and like a lot of what i taught while i was still at magic leap was about limiting 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 the amount of pixels that you used and maximizing the amount of reality so the metaverse to me you know whatever you call it wasn't about escaping from reality it was about a return to reality but still having the ability to use compute and all of these awesome things that we use it's just that now i didn't have to stare at this tiny little phone or go over and find my laptop i could just ask it and like it would show up in the right place and i could use it and i could give it to you and we could continue to be humans <laughs> and i didn't have to stop you and pull out my phone and enter the password twice because i slipped the first time and and meanwhile we've both completely forgotten what we were talking about and so for me the metaverse was always about a return to real reality and just having the ability to access all of this extra crazy data at the same time mm. right it's kind of fitting that that you went to lego after that i mean given totally. all the ar uh, stuff uh, that's happening how are you thinking about that development well the funny thing was is when i left magic leap i was like how the hell am i going to go back to a regular game company because i've like spent the last few years basically immersed in the thought that screens are kind of dying and so do i really want to spend three or four years working on a giant game on a screen <laughs> i kind of feel like i'm like in my garage building the world's greatest car and meanwhile it's about to flood you know what i mean yeah. and so going to lego actually felt very natural because lego has been you know for all intents and purposes lego has been putting pixels into the world for 85 years you know what i mean and and so like when i got to lego a lot of what i had to argue about with with normal game developers about like keeping the physical part of the experience and like how important touch was and all those sorts of things um now i didn't have to i didn't have to convince these people of that at all in fact i have to kind of do the opposite and i have to like say you know these are the reasons why this type of interactivity is super important <laughs> because they're so used to like just handing people stuff and then walking away that that like for them it's 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 not a problem to say yeah yeah you know let's let's use as few pixels as possible that's not something i have to to talk to them about Wow, uh, what a journey. I mean, this is like, it's been such a treat to get to have, have you with us for, for a full hour and pick your brain. And thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful speech. Uh, and I hope to see yeah. you soon again. Uh, yeah, for sure. Talk so, to you soon. Uh, yeah, so with that, thank you so much. Another applause. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. So bye for now and thanks again. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye.